St. Joseph in nine points. St. Joseph is the silent saint. And this video I have designed to be a brief, short instruction, like a class on St. Joseph. Tomorrow is the feast of St. Joseph. And I think all of us, our, our marriages, our families, our kids, our churches, need more St. Joseph. So this is a little mini class on our silent St. Joseph. He's called the terror of demons. He is the foster father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the guardian of the Holy Family of the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph. Today we're going to look at what his name means, uh, where he appears in the Bible, his status as tecton. You've probably heard him referred to as a carpenter, but the Greek in the gospel is tecton and why that is important. We'll look at where he lived, what he did. Was he sinless? Interesting question that theologians have discussed. And also, was he also assumed into heaven? You might be surprised at the answer. And then probably one of the most popular debates around St. Joseph is, was he a young man when Christ was born or was he an old man? It's the young Joseph theory versus the old Joseph theory. I like, I'm just going to give you a little preview. I like the young Joseph theory. That's why I've chosen this picture right here. It's the young Joseph. I'll explain why there's two, two different depictions of Joseph. Also, I'll discuss, was, were Joseph and Our Lady Mary, Mary, were they married or not? You'll hear a lot of people say that Mary was an unwed mother. I'll explain why that's not only wrong, but if you actually formally affirm that, you're actually espousing material heresy, and you don't want to do that. You don't want to also bring dishonor to Mary, Joseph, and Christ. And then are there relics of St. Joseph? So we got a lot to cover today, but I'm going to do it quickly. All right, I want this to be a video that you can show uh, to your spouse or to your kids and, and get fired up about St. Joseph. Oh, I'm also going to cover... Since Joseph's feast day falls on a Friday, can you eat meat on that Friday? I think you'll be surprised at the answer because I'm going to say something probably that you've heard otherwise. All right, let us pray. I'm going to pray the Our Father together. In nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater noster, qui es in celi, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, secut in cello et in terra. Panam nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos amalo. Amen. Sancte Joseph, ora pro nobis, nomini patris et fidii, et spiritus sancti. All right, welcome everyone. If you like this video so far, please hit that like button, share the video on Facebook, or you, uh, yeah, you could share it on YouTube, Twitter, Parlor, Gab, whatever you do. And please subscribe if you're new. This is a live video, and you'll be notified every time we go live. Also, everybody, thanks for the super chats. And at the end of this video, I'll be explaining how I'm giving away two heirloom quality, gorgeous rosaries for the celebration of Easter. All right, let's get right into it. Joseph, St. Joseph, let's begin with his name. In Hebrew, it is Yosef, Yosef, and it means increase, increase, growth. And St. Bernard of Clairvaux said that he's called Joseph because by him, God increased the gifts and graces that are given to the world. He is the one chosen by God, predestined by God, to look over the eternal Son of God, born of a woman, born of the Immaculate Virgin Mary. Number two, Joseph 
doesn't have a lot of parts in Scripture. You don't see very much of them. In fact, Joseph is not mentioned in Mark's Gospel, but he features in Matthew and Luke. And he's briefly mentioned in John where it says, Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. So we see him there, and he's, at, especially in Matthew and Luke, we see a little bit more of him, but there's not a lot there. And in fact, Scripture has him not speaking at all. People have said he's the silent saint. He has not one vocal recording in all four Gospels. Now, that's not exactly correct because when they go to circumcise the Christ child, they ask what name it should be. And in Jewish culture, custom, and law, it's the father who says the name. And we read that the name given was Jesus, so we know Joseph would have said that. So this is, I think, kind of special. The only thing we know from Scripture that, G that Joseph actually said in the Bible is that he said the name of Jesus at his circumcision of Christ. Now, I mentioned in the intro, you've heard Joseph is called the carpenter. This is the third point. We're going nine points today, nine facts, keeping it simple. He's called the carpenter. But if you look in the Greek, he's called a tecton. Now, this is often translated as carpenter, but it means more than carpenter. A tecton is someone who is an artisan. They can work in wood, like a carpenter. They can work in stone, like a stonemason. Uh, they can work in plaster. They can work in metal. They could be roofers, furniture makers, builders, architects, everything. So when we say he's a carpenter, I think that sells him a little bit short. He is a tecton, which means physical building and physical repair. We get the word technology and architecture. You can hear that word tecton in there. So he's, he's really more than a carpenter, Joseph is. And of course, he would be teaching the craft to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's also interesting because Christ is the son of David. We know that Joseph and Mary were of the house of David. That's why they went to Bethlehem. And you'll remember David received the vision, the blueprint for the temple in Jerusalem. And his son Solomon, King Solomon, is the one who built the temple where they put the Ark of the Covenant. Now, we know that the true temple of God was not a building in Jerusalem. The true temple of God is the body of Jesus Christ. This is why Christ says, destroy this body and in three days I will raise it again. And they say, Phew took 46 years to build this temple. But he, Christ was referring to the temple of his body. Who was the one who was the tecton of the body of Christ? Got him the food, got him the clothes, made his bed so he could sleep, took care of him every single day, who, who helped, in a way, the growth of the true temple of God, that is the body of Christ. It was Joseph. So in this way, Joseph stands in continuity with King David, King Solomon, in building and protecting the temple of God. That means he's truly the tecton, the architect, the builder. Now, number four, where did the Holy Family live and what did they do? So Joseph was of the house of David, which means he hailed from Bethlehem, but he lived in Nazareth, which is to the north. It's about 40 miles walk, 65 kilometers for all you non-Americans, to Jerusalem. I think that's right. So not something you can do in a day, something you can do in a few days. And Nazareth was the suburb of a town called Sepphoris. Sepphoris. Now, Sepphoris was a wealthy place. It was cosmopolitan. It had a lot of Greek culture. People there, probably the main language was not Hebrew or Aramaic. It was Greek. And there would have been a lot of building projects, a lot of furniture, all kinds of things, because this is a Roman and Hellenistic colony within the Holy Land, Sepphoris. So since they lived very close to Sepphoris, like a short walk, I think it's under an hour walk, 
probably the workman, a tecton like Joseph, his commission, his living would very likely come from Sepphoris and doing dealings with them there where they spoke Greek. That means Joseph probably knew Aramaic, which he spoke at home with Our Lady and Our Lord Jesus Christ. Also in his business dealings was likely sp speaking Greek, especially as he went into Sepphoris. I believe there's a tradition. I'm working on a book, by the way, on Joseph. It's St. Joseph in 50 pages. I'm doing a lot of research. There is a tradition, I believe, that St. Joachim and St. Anne, who are the parents of the Blessed Virgin Mary, I think there is a tradition that they are from or lived in Sepphoris. Okay? Um, it also shows that there were Gentiles, non-Jews, living near them. Like I said, they speak Greek, probably speaking Latin. It could be. This is why people say that Christ spoke Aramaic at home, Hebrew at synagogue, Greek most certainly at Sepphoris, and probably because there's so many Romans at Sepphoris, Latin is too. So he could have been tetralingual or quadlingual. Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Latin. We know that Christ spoke with Pontius Pilate. We don't know if that was in Greek, Latin, uh, or Aramaic. So this means that Joseph probably is multilingual. Number five, the two traditions of old Joseph, who was a widower. This tradition says his first wife has died. He has multiple children. And this would explain the brothers and sisters of Christ, that these are the biological children of Joseph but not the biological children of the Blessed Virgin Mary because she is ever virgin before the birth of Christ, during the birth of Christ, and after the birth of Christ, she died a virgin. It's Catholic teaching that Joseph and Our Lady never had those relations, marital relations. The other tradition, which actually is pretty old, is that Joseph was a younger man. So Our Lady would have been in her teens, and Joseph would be probably around the time of Christ, 30 years old. And that Joseph had committed himself to virginity, and that Our Lady had, con had committed herself to virginity. And through a miracle, you'll see in the image here, the lilies, those are signs of virginity. There is a tradition that Joseph's staff bloomed flowers, and this was a sign that he should be joined to the Virgin Mary, because the Virgin Mary, according to Catholic tradition and Eastern tradition, she, from the age of three until about age 15, lived as a consecrated virgin in the temple in Jerusalem. Did you know that? And then once she became pubescent, she could no longer live in the temple precincts, and so she had to be joined to a man. And so there was the Virgin Joseph and the Virgin Mary, and that they were brought together. Now, this brings us to the next question, number six. Were Joseph and Mary truly married, especially since they never consummated their marriage? The answer is yes. St. Thomas Aquinas gives 12 reasons why Joseph was married to marry a valid marriage. You can go to my website, taylormarshall.com, search Thomas Aquinas, reasons, 12 reasons Joseph and Mary were married. It goes into it. You will hear liberal priests around Christmas time say, Well, the Blessed Virgin Mary, she's the patron of all the unwed mothers. Eh, that's wrong. Catholic teaching is that Joseph and Mary were married. The angel came to a woman espoused to St. Joseph. Espoused to St. Joseph. They were, in fact, married. Why is this important? If they were not married and Mary gave birth to a child, according to Jewish law, the child would be a bastard and illegitimate. There is no way anyone in Israel would listen to Jesus Christ our Lord in the synagogues or that he would have access to the temple or to the crowds if he were an illegitimate bastard born outside of wedlock. That's what illegitimate or bastard means. 
born outside wedlock. He was born inside wedlock. This means that in God's plan for the Holy Family, they are a nuclear family. They are a nuclear family with a mom, a dad, and a child. Now people say, well, if Mary and Joseph never consummated the marriage, how is that a valid marriage? Here's how St. Thomas Aquinas explains it. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, please like it and please share it and please subscribe. Thomas Aquinas says that in normal marriage, so let's take myself, Taylor, and my wife, Joy. On our wedding day, we made vows to one another till death do us part, but we also had to have the openness to having children and then to consummate and bring forth children, if biologically possible for us it was. We've had eight beautiful children. That makes a valid marriage. If you go to a marriage and you say, one of the persons or both of the persons, like, yeah, we don't want to have kids. Kids are lame. Forget that. We just want to travel and have fun together. If that's what you go in with marriage, your marriage is invalid, null, and void. Because the purpose, the primary purpose of marriage is the procreation and education of children. Don't forget the education part. Procreation and education. If you go into marriage saying, I'm not doing that, you are not validly marriage, married. Now, Joseph and Mary were consecrated virgins. So how would their marriage be valid? Well, Thomas Aquinas says that both Joseph and Mary were open to and consented to the miraculous conception by the Holy Ghost of the second person of the Trinity in her virginal and immaculate womb. They consented to the openness of life. Now, it's a unique one. This happens to no other couple before or after. It's a unique situation in which both of them were open to the supernatural means of a virginal conception and a virginal birth. They welcomed the child who was conceived in a miraculous way, and they educated the child. And so by their assent to this mystery, that, since there is no marital relations, but they do welcome the child, and that makes it a valid marriage. Does that make sense? Number seven. It is said by many theologians that Joseph himself was confirmed in grace while in his mother's womb. What does confirmed in grace mean? It means God gives you so much grace, so much grace, you're confirmed in grace, that you will never commit a sin again. You move from the purgative way to the illuminative way to the unitive way, the perfect way, and you're totally focused on God. It said later in the life of the apostles, they were confirmed in grace. Obviously, the Blessed Virgin Mary was confirmed in grace from the moment of her conception. She never had original sin, mortal sin, or venial sin. And Joseph did not have the Immaculate Conception, but it is speculated by theologians that he would receive a singular grace in the womb of his mother. Why? Okay, the Blessed Virgin Mary is the mother of Christ, and she received the Immaculate Conception. No sin from her conception. We also know that uh, St. John the Baptist is the greatest of all the prophets. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and confirmed in grace in the womb of his mother Elizabeth. I think when he was, it's either three months or six months old. I think it's six months. Six months in the womb. So theologians say, well, Joseph is greater than John the Baptist, so he would be somewhere between Mary, Immaculate Conception, John the Baptist, later justified, filled with the Holy Spirit, and confirmed in grace. And so Joseph would receive, it's only fitting, the same uh, or even a little greater than John the Baptist. Those who affirm this teaching of Joseph being sinless and regenerated and justified and sanctified and confirmed in grace in his mother's womb are uh, Francis, uh, Francisco Suarez, John Gerson, St. Alphonsus Liguori. There's also another teaching that the prophet Jeremiah was confirmed in his mother grace. I won't go there right now. Number eight. 
was Joseph assumed into heaven. Uh, many theologians, Francis de Sales, uh, Suarez, Bernardine of Siena, Jean Gerson, St. Vincent Ferrar, I mean, these are big saints, people. They say that Joseph was assumed into heaven, body and soul, like the Blessed Virgin Mary. This would have happened after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. People have noticed there are no relics of St. Joseph on earth. Don't have, we don't have any relics of Mary. We don't have any relics of St. Joseph. They aren't there. And then Francis de Sales has a hypothetical of what it must have been like when Christ died on the cross, descended into hell, went to Sheol, the limbo of the fathers, and saw his guardian and foster father, Joseph, and would have said something like this, quote, be, um, Joseph says to Jesus, Be pleased to remember, Lord, that when you came down from heaven to earth, I received you into my house and my family, and I took you into my arms from the moment you were born. Now you are going back to heaven. Take me with you, body and soul. I received you into my family. Receive me into your family. I took you in my arms. Take me into your arms. I looked after you and fed you and guided you during your life on earth. Stretch forth your hand and lead me into life everlasting. Now, we know that uh, the patriarch Joseph, who's a type of Saint Joseph, the very last two lines of Genesis, Joseph the patriarch makes th has them make this promise to him, quote, and Joseph made them swear to him, saying, God will visit you, carry my bones with you out of this place. And he died being, num being 110 years old, and being embalmed, he was laid in a coffin in Egypt, end quote. That's Genesis chapter 50. So the old patriarch Joseph, as he's dying, says, do not leave my body in Egypt, this sinful, nasty land. Take my bones with you to the Holy Land. And so because of this, Francis of Sales says, Joseph, who was the foster father, guardian, man closest to Jesus Christ in this, in this life, that Christ, after he died and rose again, would take the bones of Joseph from this world, Egypt, and take them to the promised land, which is heaven. Some have speculated that in Matthew 27, where it says, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Some people say maybe Joseph was one of those people. And then number nine, final point. I hope you're enjoying this. What about burying a statue of Joseph to sell your house it's bad don't do it don't do it it comes from a condemned practice of divination called deprecation of the saints deprecation of the saints is a form of divination and superstition uh, people uh, especially in like uh, caribbean islands even back in the old world in europe they would do deprecation of the saint. So what they would do is they would take a statue of a saint and they would put a bag over the head of the saint or they would put the saint uh, in a locker or in a closet and they would say to the statue, this is so superstitious, unless you get me a wife or unless you get me a husband or unless you get me a name, would you ever, a house, a job, I'm going to lock you up or I'm going to put this bag over the head of the saint. And they would basically um, hold them as ransom, like a hostage, until they got what they want. And the church has always condemned this. All right, so this is where the whole idea of deprecating St. Joseph comes from. You say, and until you get me a house, I'm going to bury you in the yard like a dead body, like a corpse. And if I sell this house, then I'll take you out. That's where it comes from. Now, you may have done this, and you didn't know that, and you didn't know. 
But it's still superstitious to think I'm going to bury a statue of a saint, which is disrespectful, until I get what I'm wanting. I think you can see where it comes from, and I think you should see that you should not do this. Do not, you don't buy the stupid kit and where you bury Joseph in your yard. And what's even worse is a lot of people bury Joseph, they sell the house, and then after they've moved to their new house, like, oh, we forgot to dig up Joseph. He's still over there. Shame, shame, shame. Bad. You want to know how to get Joseph to help you sell your house? Get a nice statue of Joseph or an icon of Joseph. Put it on the mantle place over your fireplace or in the most important place in your house. And every evening, burn a candle in front of his image. Kneel down, pray, and say, Joseph, please help us say, uh, sell our house. That's the right way to do it. That's the right way to do it. And then when you sell your house, say, thank you, Joseph, for praying for us. And then take your statue to your new house. Don't bury it. Don't deprecate it. All right, before we close up, um, can you eat meat tomorrow? I'm recording this on March 18th, 2021. Tomorrow is March 19th, Feast of St. Joseph, and it lands on a Friday. It's a very complicated situation because it's listed as a first-class first solemnity, but it's a Friday in Lent. Now, the 1983 Code of Canon Law that binds you under sin says that when a solemnity lands on a Friday, even in Lent, it supersedes Friday abstinence and you may eat meat. According to the 1983 Code of Canon Law, when St. Joseph's Feast Day, which is a first-class solemnity, falls on a Friday in Lent, you can eat meat. That's the 1983 Code of Canon Law. Traditionally, however, that is not the rule. If you look at the 1917 Code of Canon Law, it says in section 1252, period 4, section 4, on Sundays or feasts of precept, the laws of abstinence and of fast cease, except for feasts during Lent. All right. So if you want to do the traditional rendering or if you have a traditional calendar on your wall, you'll notice the fish is still there for March 19th. That's because before the change in the rules, Joseph was still a meatless day. How do you know this? I asked a good priest and he said, uh, there's the tradition of St. Joseph tables. These are all over Italy. They're brought to America. That People make beautiful tables like altars with statue of St. Joseph. And they put beautiful bread and fish and vegetables. And it's for the poor to come and the family to come. It's a beautiful tradition. Everyone should do it tomorrow. A Joseph table. They're always meatless. There's never, ever meat on a St. Joseph table. Because this traditional devotion goes back to the traditional days. Because here's the problem. If jo the Feast of St. Joseph, which I love, and you should party. You should party on the Feast of St. Joseph. But the meat part, why are there 46 days in Lent? There's 40 days, and then there's six extra days for the six Sundays in Lent. Well, if Joseph's feast day always falls in Lent, we should change the length of Lent from 46 days to 47 days, because you got 40 days plus the six Sundays in Lent, and then you got to always have Joseph in there too, and that's a day off. So you should have 47 days, but this is kind of weird, right? So what you should do, if you want to follow the, and you're not under sin, this is just Taylor Marshall on a webcam talking. You don't have to do with what I'm saying. But if you want to follow the traditional way, you'll have a Joseph table, you'll, you'll have fun, you'll party, you'll feast, but it's still a meatless Friday. If you want to go old school, if you don't care and you're like, I'm following the 1983 Code of Canada, I'm going to have some burgers, I'm going to have some ribeyes on Friday, you are not under uh, any obligation and you're not under sin. So whether you eat meat on St. Joseph's Feast Day on a Friday or not, it's not a matter of sin. It's just really, do you want to use the 1917 Code, the old school, or do you want to follow the new school, 1983? St. Joseph, pray for us. I love St. Joseph. Now, 
I'm really excited because I'm giving away two rosaries. And I actually see the lovely lady here in the live chat. She's with us today. Uh, she makes amazing rosaries. Uh, it's called Seraphim Rosaries. She made two rosaries that I'm going to be giving away. This is one of them here. This is for the men. I'm giving one rosary away to the men. And I'm going to give another rosary away for a, a lady. This is this one here. Uh-oh. This is one's blue, one's black. She hand casts these things. They're heirloom quality. They're beautiful. Um, I have a few of them here. Here's one that she made. This is my wife's. It's gorgeous. It's heavy duty. And then I'm going to tell you a story about this one. This one is mine. It's heavy duty. I mean, this is like serious weapon against the devil. Speaking of which, I was in an airport when I was at a, a rally. I came back through Pittsburgh and I was running late. I was about to miss my flight and I had a carry on was going to grab it and go, excuse me, sir, uh, you're, uh, you, you got a problem with your bag. I'm like, oh my goodness. And I, and I waited and I waited and I'm looking at my watch. I'm going to miss my flight. It's like closing boarding in like six minutes and I got to run down there. Finally, they get to my bag, they open it up and they pull this rosary out of my bag and they look at it and they're all confused. And I'm like, yeah, it's a rosary. And they're like, okay, all right, you can go now. And I said, why, why did you stop me for this? And they said, we thought it was a weapon, sir. Well, let me tell you something. This is a weapon. They were right. Now, I didn't want to say it is a weapon because then they might pull me you know, for even more. But I'm giving away two of those to patrons. If you support on Patreon, your name's already in the drawing. Uh, any level on Patreon doesn't matter if, you're, if you support a lot or support a little. Um, if you're on Patreon, I'm going to give one away, random drawing. I'll probably have Maggie do the drawing to one of the ladies on Patreon. And then uh, one drawing for the men on Patreon. And you'll win one of these amazing heirloom rosaries. Let me put it back on the screen here. I mean, these things, this is the kind of rosary that you get someone for their like first communion. Or like when you're getting married and you want the legit for real rosary that'll be in your family for five generations. This is it. I love these rosaries. I have tons of rosaries, but this is the nicest one I have. I'm not getting paid to say this, by the way. This is not a paid advertisement. I'm getting zero commission, zero affiliate. I just like these rosaries. So I'm giving these away. The drawing will be you'll win it on Easter. One man, one woman. If you want to support on Patreon, uh, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash dr taylor marshall and i will be putting up another wisp, uh, dream whisper file so you can listen to the bible and the church fathers uh, tomorrow i'll either put up hebrews or romans so you can listen to that also available to everyone over at who supports at patreon.com forward slash dr taylor marshall last week i did a live q a for the patrons and i plan to do another live q a tomorrow friday i don't have the time set up but this is a time for you to get on with me for 15 or 20 minutes with other patrons and we do q a and you can literally ask me about anything um, as long as it's not too personal and i'll answer those things live that's for everyone who does the two book and above uh, live q a over at patreon.com forward slash dr taylor marshall okay friends make sure that you're praying the rosary every single day if you don't pray the rosary you're not on the team you got to pray the rosary that's why i'm giving away these rosaries i thought you know it's easter i got a lot of generous kind good people who support this podcast on youtube and through patreon and i was like i want to get them something and i can't get everybody something but i was like you know maybe I, i'm always talking about the rosary pray the rosary every day what if i like hey i want to give you like a $200 rosary, like a nice rosary for Easter. That's what we're doing. Um, so check it out. And if you just want to get one of these nice rosaries, again, I'm not getting paid. This is not a commercial, no affiliate. Um, go to Seraphim Rosaries. Let me see if I can put Here we go. It's online. That's it right there. Gorgeous, gorgeous rosaries. And um, 
they're really beautiful. Uh, it's amazing how many I, I meet people who have them too. They're like, oh wow, I got one of those seraphim roses, uh, rosaries. It's really cool. I said seraphim rose, Eastern Orthodox bros are like that. Okay, pray the rosary every day. Read the Bible every day, and remember our Lord Jesus Christ says you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. And it'd be a shame if I forgot the Ave Maria, but I didn't. Let us pray the Hail Mary. Nomini Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et et ora mortis nostrae. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicuterat in principio et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Sancte Joseph, ora pro nobis. All right, friends. Thanks so much for watching. I am working on a book on St. Joseph, St. Joseph in 50 pages. I'm at about 40 pages, so I got 10 more pages to go. That'll be out hopefully this year, and um, hopefully that's a helpful resource as well. I already said the outro, so I don't know what to say. How about this? St. Joseph, pray for us. God bless. Godspeed. Happy Lent.